This time on episode 411 of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., we're going to be discussing episodes 6 through 9 of the 1992 X-Men animated series, including some background into one of the main X-Men animated series creators, Margaret Lesh. We're going to be discussing the weekly Marvel Studio news, including James Gunn talking about the end of the Guardians of the Galaxy team as it exists today, an update of Loki Season 2, and how the Eternals' domestic box office compared to all the other MCU films, as well as what are your comfort MCU films. I'm Anthony Bachman from All Things Good and Nerdy, a geeky podcast part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other fantastic geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. You have been granted clearance by director Alfonso Mac McKenzie. Stand by for a shield debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the shield director. Now it's time for a scheduled debriefing. I'm Agent Michelle. I'm Agent Chris. And I'm producer of the show, Director SP. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., a Marvel Comic Universe fan show discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Comic Book Universes as told on screen by Marvel Studios. This show is recorded on Thursday, February 3rd, 2022. Happy Ground Dogs Day, again. Live from the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. studios and broadcast Fox Kids Wide via www.geeks.live. Come and join our live chat as we record. Gang, happy National Carrot Cake Day. My grandmother's carrot cake recipe is the best carrot cake recipe in the world. Fight me. Does she do carrot cake with or without frosting? With frosting. It's cream cheese frosting. Okay. And we put in, she puts in pineapple and it works. I need to try that. I'm not a huge fan of carrot cake anyway. Pineapple in most things is good, including pizza. Fight me. Carrot cake is generally good. I mean, if I have a choice between chocolate cake and carrot cake, I'll choose chocolate cake or vanilla cake with chocolate frosting. That's just the way I am. Chocolate trumps all, but a good carrot cake, a good moist, very tasty carrot cake is very good. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm hungry for cake and I can't go get any because I'm stuck at home due a, to a snow emergency. Hmm. I'll have to count that in when I'm creating the show notes next time. Is SP going to be stuck at home? Let's not talk about food. Hmm. Okay. You don't have supplies to make yourself a cake at your house already? You know, I might. I'll have to go look in the pantry and see. I might do that. I got a brand new air fryer. I might try that. All right. Well, let's pause the show while SP goes and makes it. I don't want to edit that long, so I'll just do it later and... Let everybody know how it went, or didn't, because I didn't have the stuff to make it. Well, anyway, let's get talking about the main topic of the show, which is Marvel stuff, because we love talking about Marvel. Because of riding on an airplane wing to Scotland. If you'd like to tell us about your experiences riding on an airplane wing, especially going to Scotland, you can head on over to our website at legendsofshield.com. If you like to discuss how that whole sequence was an illusion or reference to William Shatner's episode on the Twilight Zone, you can leave us a voicemail at 844 the bus one It's 844-843-2871. If you have any theories on how out of that entire airplane, only one passenger saw you sitting on the wing, head on over to Twitter and tag us at Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. You can see us on YouTube, youtube.com slash geek. And if you just want to tell us all about how Scotland is the best place to go because they have one of the best accents, join our Discord server at gunnageek.com slash Discord. And remember, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a proud member of the gunnageek.com network. All right, we watched four episodes of X-Men animated series. I'm hoping that we watch the correct four episodes as we are recording this podcast. We'll talk about that in just a bit. You guys ready to talk about it? Yes. Oh, yeah. I 
X-Men the Animated Series from 1992. We're going to go a little bit in depth tonight on who ordered it and thus created it. We're going to talk about Margaret Lesh. Now, just as an informal poll here on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., don't worry, nobody's going to tell anybody. Have either of you two heard of Margaret Lesh before today? Not really. The first time I read the show notes. All right. I did not know who Margaret Lesh was, and I consider myself a bad person for not knowing because she was instrumental in so much for not only kids entertainment, but a lot of the entertainment that I enjoyed not only growing up, but also as an adult, even to this day, really, when it comes down to it. So who was she at the time the X-Men, the animated series was being ordered she was the head of fox kids so she was the one who ordered x-men she had a long-standing care for the x-men she was part of a failed pilot in 1989 called the pride of the x-men i believe that was what it was called and she just wanted to get it off the ground and she wanted to do it right but before we get there let's talk about the entirety of her career over her career which spanned more than 50 years well, 40 years by the time she decided to retire. More than 40 years. She started in 1971, but she has over 50 producer and 37 production manager credits that started in 1978. Some of her production credits include Popeye, The Flintstones, Scooby and Scrappy-Doo, Super Friends, Meanwhile, The Hall of Justice. She was one of the people behind that. The Smurfs, G.I. Joe, Dungeons and Dragons, The Transformers and Transformers the Movie, G.I. Joe, My Little Pony, Fraggle Rock, Robocop, Pride of the X-Men as we talked about before, Muppet Babies. She also was accredited for 76 creator credits, including X-Men the Animated Series. So I was like, wow, what has she done? And this is not a complete list because I know for a fact she was involved in Hasbro as well. Starting in 1979, she was the head of Hanna-Barbera Productions. That's where like the Flintstones and Scooby and Scrappy-Doo stuff came in. She was the head of Marvel Productions LTD from 1984 to 1990. She took over as Fox Kids president in 1990 to 1997. She was also the head she brought, she was brought in to be the head of Jim Henson Television, which actually has a domino effect. She was brought in in 1998. Jim Henson, I didn't realize this at the time, Jim Henson Television bought significant shares of what became Crown Media, which their jewel production is Hallmark Channel. So she was involved in taking two religious channels that had been combined into one. I think it was Odyssey Network or something like that. They were religious channels. She changed the programming from religious to family, started Crown Media and specifically Hallmark Channel between Jim Henson Television, which is that's what it became, and the Hallmark Company. They created the Hallmark Channel. And she was the person that's credited for starting the Hallmark Channel. So that was all her. And then she went on to do a couple of other things, kind of. The charity stuff, I guess. Uh, a couple of things that she did was a Hatchery LLC and Hub Television Network. She quasi retired in 2009 from television and then again in 2014 was a more formal retirement, basically stating, I've done everything. I deserve a little time off. And I would think so. From 1971 through 2014, she was very busy. So also, she was an executive. I, I told you she did other things. She was an executive with ABC, NBC, Hanna-Barbera, Marvel Productions, thus Marvel Entertainment, which produced this, and then many, many more things, was over involved in over 100 live action and animated series and specials. She was just amazing. Now, I looked for video of her anywhere, like a video interview, either on the news sites because she was a media personality. You would think that she would have been interviewed at some point in time, but I guess she was just dealing with stuff that wasn't in the spotlight at the time. And she was 
not in the era that we are today where media moguls get on and do interviews and that sort of stuff. But I was able to find a 30th anniversary YouTube video documentary on Batman the Animated Series. Now, there's not much crossover of her and the X-Men series in that documentary, but I actually got to see her. She was so passionate and so vibrant and just so into doing things that were good for the audience, not only kids, but for adults. And it came out in those interviews. She did mention the X-Men, the animated series in there, as well as some of the other properties that Warner Brothers brought to the table, like Animaniacs and stuff like that. But since it's a Marvel show, we won't get into that. But if you want to actually see her, I will have a link to that in the show notes. It's a two and a half hour YouTube documentary, by the way. And she's only in there in spurts of like 10 seconds. I will also put the time codes in there if you really are interested. And I would recommend that you do because she is behind not only this, but a lot of stuff that was at least in my childhood. Perhaps if you're listening to it, was in your childhood as well. And it was a lot because of her. And it was so great actually seeing her. I ran into a biography that I saw of hers on the TMC channel because she was part of the TMC channel when it started up Turner Classic Movies. And so there was a write-up there. I got a sense that it was like an old archive webpage, so I don't know when it's going to go away. I will also include that verbiage in the show notes if you want to see it and read it. I would encourage you to do that. As well as there was a article specifically on the X-Men animated series that she is accredited for, for the creation. And honestly, even with the Batman, the animated series, she was in there for the first, like, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes of that two and a half hour special. And she was not there much for the next like hour or so. And she comes back at the very end. So she wasn't really involved in the day-to-day activities of these shows, but she was sure as heck in there to make those business relationships, to make sure the companies were together. And to staff these shows with people that were going to make them work. And we'll talk more about them in the future, but I wanted to devote a lot of today to Margaret Lesh. Do either of you two have any questions about what I ran into or anything that you've spotted in the show notes? You mean to tell me she is responsible for Hallmark holiday movies? Yes, she is. Just by starting the channel, And then starting the programming of doing those holiday specials. Yeah, she was for for that first year of Hallmark Channel. Yeah. It's amazing how this person, I feel ashamed. This person is behind so much media I consumed as a child and the media SP champions every holiday season. She was not just involved in children's media, though. Laverne and Shirley, Happy Days. Are you serious? Yeah, she, she wasn't the one behind that was too early in her career but she worked on those properties yeah wow this is someone who's had so many fingers and pies i did not know i ate exactly that's why i was saying i feel like a bad person for not knowing who margaret lesh is so if margaret if you or your family members or perhaps some i don't know agent is listening to this or viewing this please get a hold of us and we would gladly we would love a chance to have you on our show. Just fun, you know, n- no high impact or anything like that. We just want to talk to you and say thank you for all of the work there. I would love that. I haven't reached out to her yet. I might in the next coming weeks. But if you or your people are listening to this, I think it would be a great idea to have you on board if you have the time. Chris, what do you think? How can one person do all of this? and? such different stuff too like if it had just been a bunch of superhero things you know that kind of makes sense but just the wide breadth of everything i mean that's just amazing and you know what i just because she's done all of that i will forgive her for the australian wolverine oh you guys don't know no i know in the pilot episode of the pride of the x-men Wolverine was Australian. Which actually ended up happening? Because isn't Hugh Jackman Australian? <laughs> he was Australian, yeah. She was just ahead of her time. Just a little bit, just a few years, yeah. All right. 
So if anybody in the audience has any questions, please let us know. Or if you have more knowledge of Margaret, let us know. Because I know some people watch Transformers and are involved in the Transformers crowd that listen to this podcast. So if you've run into Margaret anywhere, I would love to hear your stories. We would love to have it on the show. So please get a hold of us that way. All right. Are you guys actually ready to get on to the X-Men episodes that we watched this week? Yes. All right. Let's do it. I really hope I watch the right ones too. Now you have me worried. Previously on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. Because of bad Cajun accents, Mom Petit. I've said it on Twitter. I'll say it here again. If you skip the intro to this show, we cannot be friends. I'm not going to talk about that. If I hadn't seen anything X-Men, I still know that the two of them are very well linked and have a lot of history between the two. People need to remember that I believe it was Jack Kirby who went down into the lobby and punched somebody. I don't know if that's a rumor or not, but you were punching Nazis in in comic books and everything, there's always been a political bent to Stan Lee and everything, even though you might not have seen it right when it was a kid. This is a way that they were able to address a lot of these themes. I mean, he ends up throwing a tenter tantrum because a girl doesn't like him. Don't take a drink every time you'll get alcohol poisoning. <laughs> And the way he's drawn, you certainly get a sense of how much hair he's got on his arms. Also, with Rogue, by the way, entirely almost different set of powers. Yeah, her core power is that she can take strength from other people, and that's very similar. But she can fly. She's pretty strong on her own right. And she's, wow, I, I'm liking this version of Rogue. It's probably not comic book accurate, but maybe it is. I don't know. In the courtroom, I'm like, the public, public's not that bad. It could never be that bad. And now I'm watching it now and it's like, oh my goodness. The court scene when they're throwing the tomato and then you see footage of school parents at school board meetings or something else. And it's just like, you know, this was supposed to be a warning, not a playbook. It's the power of 1960s Marvel magnetism. Do whatever you need it to. As Haley used to say in the show, because of magnets. <laughs> we saw Deadpool. We definitely saw Deadpool last time. Thanks for putting that together, Chris. I enjoyed it. We'll continue as long as Chris brings it to the table. Do a previously of in honor of the X Men, the animated series previously on. All right, this is where it gets a little sticky, guys. And I had no idea that this was a thing until this week. So, the X-Men the Animated Series, episode 6 through 9, premiered on Fox Kids between February 6th, 1993, and February 27th, 1993. The problem is that episodes 6 through 9, as they aired, are not episodes 6 through 9 on Disney+. Plus. And I think, actually, the story was aired in order because episode 9... The Cure had some references to what happened with the Juggernaut as they were rebuilding the mansion, but we never saw the destruction of the mansion. So I think episode 10 on Disney Plus is the Unstoppable Juggernaut, and I think that's airing a little bit out of order. But I don't know. So I watched episode 6, 7, 8 and 9 on Disney Plus called Cold Vengeance, Slave Island, The Cure, and Come the Apocalypse. So here's an informal poll for the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. hosts here. Michelle, did you watch those same four episodes? Yes. Okay, so we're on page with each other. Chris, did you watch those four episodes or did you watch The Unstoppable Juggernaut? I wish I could say I watched The Unstoppable Juggernaut just so we could have something screwing this up. But I didn't. I watched the four we were all expecting. Awesome. So I don't know why Disney Plus swapped the two. However, I do know that in the production of the X-Men, they had significant issues with the animation house. Sab Saban, I think it is. Saban, Saban. It's a South Korean animation house. We talked a little bit about it last time. 
and there were just some production issues as it was going back and forth. This was not due to that, though, or maybe it was, I don't know, but it seemed to air in the order originally, so I'm just going to leave it as, I don't know why Disney Plus has them out of order. It just is really weird to me, especially because of the unstoppable Juggernaut and the references to Juggernaut, but it is what it is. So if you're watching episode seven, Slave Island, you jump to episode eight on Disney Plus, The Cure. And you're wondering what happened to the X-Men mansion. Just know you're going to have to wait a few episodes to episode 10 to find out. Disney tends to do things in the episode that they were aired in. The Unstoppable Juggernaut episode just wasn't finished on time. So they didn't have it. It aired on February 20th. It aired in order. It's just weird. I don't know. This one was a weird one. Yeah. We're going to get more of that weirdness as we go along, I guess. But. This one was just, I just want to call it out in case you're watching, because I thought I had skipped an entire episode because I had gone in and done the pre-research and I was looking for the title, The Unstoppable Juggernaut and got the cure. And I was like, okay, so there's some references, but I went about eight minutes into the episode before deciding now, wait, this is not the next episode. So it'll happen more, I guess. But all right, Michelle, what actually happened in the four episodes that we watched? Cold vengeance after leaving the X-Men, Wolverine looks for solitude in the Arctic, but comes across Sabretooth, who's been tracking him. When the safety of a local tribe is threatened by Sabretooth, Wolverine must defeat him. Meanwhile, Jubilee, Storm, and Gambit do some investigating in an island resort called Genosha that seems to be a safe haven for mutants. On Slave Island, Gambit, Storm, and Jubilee head to the island resort of Genosha and end up as mutant slaves. The Cure Rogue seeks a scientist who claims to be able to cure any mutant of their powers, but is he for real? Come the Apocalypse, an ancient and immensely powerful mutant called Apocalypse plots to destroy the world to bring in a newer world order. All right, so we got Muir Island, we got the Genosians, and we got Apocalypse. Those are three huge storylines in the X-Men that I've come across. Chris, you're the comic book expert. I know Michelle has read a lot more than I have, but we'll just label you the comic book expert right here. You think that these are three of the bigger comic book stories coming out of the X-Men? I mean, these are definitely important things. They're not the first things I think of, but they're definitely ones that keep getting brought up over time. And I'm really excited that they popped up this early in the series because it's something that they can just go do your thing, come back later. It's going to be a good time. All right. Talking about a good time. Let's talk about how we feel about these four episodes, Michelle. It feels like the comic and in a good way, these storylines familiar, it's just still good. It's the show is still just so good. Even with that Juggernaut episode not being there, that just kind of makes me feel like reading the comics because, okay, here's this part of the story that's going, and I'll figure out later why that kind of thing happened. I'm glad we're getting the background into the characters like right away, even though we started with the team and existing characters and existing universe, they're taking their time and going almost character by character and giving more and more in-depth background into them as they're telling the story in a way that you're getting a full story. We got into Wolverine and his bout with Sabretooth, not really background, but at least you got the 1v1 there. You got into the history of Rogue. You got a little bit more of Storm. So there were things that came along. We got Archangel. We got Apocalypse. We got Mystique. Yeah, this was a good four episodes. And if they continue to be like this. I'm excited to watch more and more and more. I'm told the first season isn't all that great. I know the fifth season isn't all that great because of production issues, but this through season four, I'm really looking forward to it, especially that next arc too, with the dark Phoenix, I believe is, is next up there. All right, Michelle, let's delve into a little bit of, you mentioned it before about rogue actually being on a plane. Let's talk about rogue. Rogue is one of the most beloved characters and one of the most tragic ones. Having the power to 
take people's strength and actually their powers for a bit by touching them sounds great. But in reality, she has to wear gloves all the time. She sees Jean and Scott together. We see the little flashback of her kissing her first boyfriend, Cody. We forget how much we touch and how much we rely on touch when we're humans. We want to hold each other's hand. We want to hug each other, kiss each other on the cheek. She just can't do a lot of these basic things. And it brings out the whole, you know, Wolverine is there with this super, you know, I can heal. Look at me. And he's like, well, there's no traitors in the X-Men. We all love our powers. And it's like, hey, you're just overlooking Rogue. And of course, I understand her going to Muir Island and debating about taking the cure. What does it mean to be, you know, normal? What does it, what does it even mean? We even, we meet Warren, who's the rich guy who's funding all of this. And here's this rich white guy who's blonde, who is ashamed of being a mutant and wants to be normal as well. And again, it's just the idea of what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be normal? And I think Storm was one of the ones that just said, we have to take time to learn who we are and to accept it. And that thought, I think, is really the through line throughout these entire episodes. Obviously, you have the rogue thing, but you also have Wolverine in the first episode we watched having to figure out who he is going up into the arctic and helping out that group of people you had the one villager who thought that his whole importance in life was being the big strong one for the village and then realizing that wolverine being there was not a big threat to him it was just somebody else who was able to help. And that kind of learning about who you are, I think, is a lot of why the X-Men as characters overall are such a beloved team in comics. And the fact that this cartoon is capturing that is why people still go and watch this cartoon and rightfully, I think, consider it one of the best comic cartoons ever made. The end of that, I don't know what to call it, Inuit Eskimo episode. I, I don't know what tribe they are. I don't want to insult anybody. Definitely go Inuit. Then. Inuit, yeah. The end of that, it was almost a letdown because they were like, well, we can't be out here anymore. We're just going to go into live in the city, even though Wolverine had helped them and everything. They were like, ah, we're just going to go and live in the city. I'm like, why? He was just there. He protected your life and your lifestyle. and he made it so that you could do it and then nothing i'm like oh but at least they're safe nobody died so to speak because with the children's program you can't show anybody dying uh, also by the way the end of that episode with the bombs on the ice bridge yeah just throw them off you know i'm i don't know i, I might not be a rocket scientist or anything but i'm just thinking an explosion underneath an ice bridge might be bad for the ice bridge. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out. I'm not a weather person, but I've watched a lot of cartoons and loud noises causes avalanches. Oh, yes, they do. Actually, they do. Even cars that cars that have backfired in real life have been known to have started avalanches. So anyway. Well, let's talk about another character that came out of nowhere really here which i love i love that we're getting characters in and out cable so cable has evolved since this has come out into this whole other character we've seen cable on the big screen in deadpool even chris what about cable so this is the fun thing with cable as he's popping up here in the cartoon they have not in the comics yet established that he is a time traveler so where did he come from? Why is he here? 
why does he think he know what needs to happen? Nobody knows, especially not him, because he's certainly not from the future yet. And I would really love to see what kind of information the writers had when they were putting these cable storylines together, because maybe they knew something was going to be coming up, and they were just counting on the comics catching up and being able to establish some kind of reasoning for why Cable was there. Maybe the writers of the comics thought, hey, we need to make Cable make sense. I don't know, but I really want to know. Yeah, that is interesting. Especially for those of us who read the comic and who ends up knowing what happens. It was really interesting just to see him being, he's just set up as this guy who was a mercenary, felt like he got hired for a certain job, that job didn't turn out right, and ended up wanting to right a wrong. It made sense. I'm like, well, and he seems to be on the side of the mutants. Wasn't too sure. If he's a mutant himself, just because he has a cybernetic eye doesn't mean he's a mutant, but he at least is on the side of mutants. Fascinating character. I got to admit, the X-Men branding has found its way all over the place, because if you take a look at Cable, his belt buckle is an X-Men belt buckle. So, I mean, it's like a X-Men fan you know, getting a hold of the gear and wearing it a lot like I'm wearing an Iron Man geeky jerseys right now. He's that sort of thing. Yeah, I I was paying attention that I'm like, okay, where exactly are they going with cable? And he did have his X-Men belt buckle. Yeah. Also, Apocalypse had the A on his belt buckle or whatever you want to call it on Apocalypse. I don't know what that is. But it was interesting watching cable. He was definitely a mercenary and he didn't know what side anybody was on. He was looking at one particular target. And anybody that got in his way, got in his way. And anybody else that didn't get in his way, he just let him be. So I'm looking forward to seeing more of Cable. I don't know how much more of Cable we're going to see. I didn't look in IMDb, see how many episodes of Cable is in. But I'm looking forward to that. It's like I said, this is a lot of great setup. And I'm looking forward to more and more story here. I do have a beef. And I promise not all my stuff is going to be beef. Because I am enjoying the series right now. but. When Storm and Gambit and Jubilee were headed to Genosha, they went to the air port, not airport, but air port on screen, two words, airport. So I'm just wondering what kind of spell check was available in 1992 when these episodes were being made. Perhaps someone who didn't speak English was trying their best. To animate the show? Yep. Somebody from South Korea, probably. Yeah. Makes perfect sense to me. I actually Googled. I'm like, okay, worldwide. Is it called airport or is it just called airport? No, it's called airport everywhere. One word, no uppercase on P. So. It makes me think about the uh, Sega Master System cart that I found that definitely says Monopoly instead of Monopoly. <laughs> oh, fun stuff, fun stuff. All right, Michelle, let's talk a little bit more about Apocalypse. Apocalypse came out. We had the four horsemen, although one was not on a horse. I don't know if that's comic actor or not. But anyway, Apocalypse shows up, and we all know Apocalypse is a big X Men villain. We do. And if you're someone who is sitting there going, that X-Men movie wasn't, that apocalypse in the movie wasn't all that great. He just seemed lackluster. Was he really a threat? Watch the animated series. Yes, it seems over the top, but here is a being who really not sure if it's a mutant or someone else. It's like, if you thought Magneto was bad, Magneto has a cause and has respect for some life apocalypse is just let's just wipe everything clean and i don't care if you're a human i don't care if you're a mutant I, whatever 
you're either one of my minions or you are just wiped from the planet. Although he was strangely cool with Rogue just magically not being the first one that was going to become one of his horsemen, which is kind of surprising when you see how he treats everything else. But we get that really sweet Walt Simonson Archangel design, and I'm so happy that they found a way to get that in here. I don't know if Archangel is going to be in more of this or not. It's kind of nebulous at the end because he gets all his evilness sucked out of him by rogue which i guess is another big thing for rogue right but he keeps the look at least and i don't know how that's going to translate in the future but we get archangel too which is great we also get war pestilence and famine as well uh, i thought they were played pretty well and i enjoyed seeing that i did have okay Again, I promise I'm not going to just nitpick this whole thing, but the battles happen around recognizable landmarks. So they start out in Paris where the peace accords are happening, and then they end up at Stonehenge. It's like, you couldn't have picked like a countryside cornfield somewhere? No, you have to mess up Stonehenge because Apocalypse's ship is under Stonehenge, and then the ship goes up and there's no more Stonehenge. Well, yeah, how do you think he finds it? If you just have it in the middle of a field, it could be anywhere. Oh, okay, good landmark. Yeah, yes. Should have put it under the pyramids. Stargate program. <sighs> also, Gambit's personal clothes, I love. I love the pick there. Just take his normal costume, which is obviously a costume, right? It's obviously not normal people clothes. And just put a coat over it, and he's a civilian. Okay. Am I missing something? Was there something going on in LA maybe that made that okay at the time? Miami? I don't know. I would think it would get hot there with a coat on, though. He's from New Orleans. It gets hot and humid down there, so he's in a less hot and humid environment and wear a coat. Okay. Also, he's just really comfortable with who he is. I guess. Through line. Yeah, he's comfortable who he is to a point well, first of all, he's got a death wish because he really wants that kiss from Rogue. Yeah, I mean, he's like Gunnivor over like three episodes. He's like, hey, let's, yeah, we can go out and we can whatever. I'll touch you. Does he not know what that means? He obviously does. I just don't get it. It's escaping me who wrote it right now, but there is a comic where Rogue and Gambit are together uh, romantically. And. It's really bothering me that I can't remember who wrote it now because I want to go read it and I know that it's it's a fairly recent thing and it's somebody who I'm going to feel really stupid about forgetting that they're the ones who wrote it. But that is something that happens eventually in the comics. Plus, it's Rogue. Can you blame him? Yes, I remember this storyline back from when I was reading Marvel. I read, I don't know, I, I don't want to talk too long about how a lot of these stories come from the 1990s. Again, this series led to the comics boom in the 1990s. I witnessed the rise and the quick fall of it. And it is part of, it is a comic accurate deal. But Gambit is... A bit too, coming on a bit too strong there, buddy. Just a little bit. So another thing that Gambit has is he's got this, I don't know, wish to kill everybody around him because he's just touching stuff and make it explode, right? So you got to watch yourself when you're around Gambit because if you don't, he might like do a prank and accidentally blow you up in the process or something like that. But one of the people he has an issue with is Cyclops, which came out really early in episode six of this and then just perpetrated throughout these four episodes who is gambit and everybody but gambit definitely has a thing against cyclops as i don't want to talk any more about it i definitely had an issue with him chris what what's going on with cyclops cyclops knows where gambit came from as viewers we do not know at this point where gambit came from gambit is being reckless i very much appreciate 
that they are showing that his power is not just the cards, it's charging up anything, and he is taking full advantage of that. But Cyclops also needs to take a chill pill here. He's at about a 12. I need him to come down to a 2. Yeah. That triangle of Cyclops, Wolverine, Gambit. Wolverine and Gambit have sketchy past Cyclops very much righteous. Everything needs to be proper. And there's an order to things. And just Scott. Come on, Scott. Attitude. You're right, Chris. Attitude. I saw one or heard one or whatever and noticed one sensible thing from Scott. They were Mirror Island and he was saying, well, you know, maybe some people don't want to be mutants. We can't make that decision for them. Maybe it was back at the mansion. I don't know. But he said, yeah, we, we have to keep this open. If there is a way for mutants to become non-mutants anymore, we have to keep that open and available for people that don't want to be mutant. And wow, fast forward 30 years and that has definitely a different meaning today than it did back in 1992 and very true even today. And it's kind of surprising coming out of Scott's mouth. I thought it was a little bit out of character for him too, but I don't know, maybe it's part of his character trying to think altruistically. It's part of Xavier. Xavier has that same idea and you have to realize one of the things that you notice is Cyclops, in these four episodes, there's that moment where Cyclops isn't listening to every, anyone until Xavier calls in. And Cyclops is like, okay, daddy speaking. And that's very important to realize when Cyclops is off the rails or just being anything. And Xavier comes in, it's just like, Scott, no, Cyclops, no. It's very much, yes, dad. If anybody wants a good look at how Cyclops got to be the way that he is, I highly recommend the Marvel Snapshots episode of Cyclops written by Jay Edited. You mentioned the trio, Gambit, Wolverine, and Cyclops. Getting a little bit more into Wolverine here. When he came back from the tundra, or the Arctic, I believe is what it was referred to as, to the mansion, He's like, well, where'd you guys go? And he's, or where did you go? And he's like, oh, I, I was just out. And then he sniffed like he had a cold because he was out in the cold. It's like Wolverine has this incredible healing power. It's how he got to survive in the cold, cold ocean and anything else that he's been against with. Does Wolverine get colds? I don't think he would, but maybe I'm not adept at the Wolverine lore here. Healing bones and muscle is different than cells fighting off a foreign invader, such as a virus. Also, he's not completely invulnerable. He just gets to come back from everything. So he still has the effects. We saw Wolverine earlier all bandaged up. I mean, he still needs to get himself medically taken care of so that he doesn't get giant infections and everything going into him. Although I, I still think that that would just kind of slow down his overall healing speed. But it's not like he can just go off and do whatever he wants. And you talked about his past with Sabretooth, which at this point, I don't know if it's a deal or not, right? All right. The last thing that we want to talk about is Mystique. We get mystique which if you watch the movies you get a lot of mystique and jennifer lawrence everybody knows mystique but this is our first entrance into mystique and she is working for apocalypse there's no doubt about it apocalypse is her master not magneto which is interesting coming from the movies i don't know who was her master first it kind of fits that it was magneto but i don't know do either of you two have any background here Yes. I don't want to spoil anything. I know this is like, oh, it's from 1992, Michelle. But again, I want to preserve it for SP because uh, Chris, Chris, we know. We know. 
there are things that have happened as we get in the movies too eventually there's things that have happened there but we get a basic idea of who mystique is right oh indeed right off the bat she's a you know we've learned she's a shapeshifter we learn she's out for herself she completely when rogue has her spills the beans but then betrays her tries to kill her tries to escape realize even though she says apocalypse is her master she obviously cares about herself first all right i think that's it for our discussion today we'll get a chance to wrap up i was wrong before i thought we would get the dark phoenix coming up next but no we get days of future past next is part of the arc that we're watching next i'm looking forward to that so this series has me engaged is it the best series ever for me yet no because i like other properties and like more of a sci-fi guy but this has my attention i thought it wouldn't have my attention but it does it has my attention and i like learning about it so thank you very much for bringing me along with you guys on your rewatch and my first watch and i don't know how long this is going to take us year year and a half this was five years when it originally came out so we get it a lot more condensed than that and i'm looking forward to the next stuff so with that you want to say anything about these four episodes michelle it's only going to get better i know eventually like the fifth season but this show does get better and it starts off strong and it's still still going to get so good and we'll talk about those fifth season production issues later it stems a little bit from the marvel bankruptcy that occurred at the time and a change of animation and stuff like that but chris what are your last thoughts they're doing a really good job keeping comics accurate to things that's something that i'm used to looking at from video game aspects over on play comics and it's something that i can't watch this and not keep in mind and the fact that it's been so long since i've seen this i think is really helping me enjoy it here because i'm refusing to look up anything my wife is watching these with me so that if i need to look something up she's seen enough things with me she knows like she will not tell me things if she thinks that it's going to ruin me watching this and so much fun going through this again she is more than welcome to join us on a future episode she can pick i don't care she can be on them all i don't care but she's more than welcome to join us so next time we are going to be closing out season one episodes 10 through 13 in that weird realm of of whatever but we're going to be closing out season one and that will be next week in the meantime we do have some marvel studio news to get to Well, first up, box office history for Marvel Cinematic Universe movies as Marvel's Eternals tops. Just one other MCU film as domestic box office run ends. So released amid a global pandemic after multiple delays, Eternals domestic box office take comes in second to last of all the Marvel Cinematic Universe films sandwiched between two phase one films. Finishing ahead of 2008's The Incredible Hulk, but falling behind 2011's Captain America The First Avenger in a report from the numbers, Chloe Zhao's Eternals finished its domestic run with $164.87 million at the domestic box office. The second film in the MCU's Phase 1, Incredible Hulk, managed $134.81 million, while the fifth entry, First Avenger, pulled in $176.65 million. For reference, Avengers Endgame currently holds the top domestic revenue spot with $858.37 million. That's a lot of millions. Also, it's not a big surprise that this isn't a huge moneymaker here. Because of when it was released, you still had people who didn't want to go to theaters. Everything here is kind of going to come with an asterisk, I think, with box office totals. Right, so you have... 
several things happening at the same time. You have the end of the Infinity War saga, right? And everybody has come to love those characters and anything. And then now you're injecting these new characters. Shang Chi did okay. Eternals did not. Could have been the timing because Shang Chi was in September. Eternals was in November, so different pandemic time frames. Things were relatively okay in September. They weren't in November. A little bit of that. Also, because it's the beginning of a new phase one, that's basically what phase four is. It's the new phase one. You are getting a little bit unknown with the characters. Yes, you know this broader universe exists, but you're like, what's happening? Why are these people here? There were things wrong with the movie. I'm not going to dissuade that. I enjoyed the movie. I just think it was a bad fitting on time with COVID and a bad fitting with the timing of the phases where you got brand new characters that you're trying to bring forward and it's just not hitting with audiences as well as it was before. If this wasn't for COVID, I have every expectation that this was have done a lot better in the box office than it did, but it's going to have that stink on it forever. And because of that, I don't think we're ever going to get another Eternals movie. I think we're going to get other movies, Thor, Guardians of the Galaxy, Avengers movies, but we're never going to get another Eternals movie. It just didn't do all that well at the box office. And you are talking about it had a big cast that cost a lot of money. Maybe not everybody, but there were big names in the cast. And it's not, you, you can't finance a new, another one. They just don't want to take that risk. And you also don't have a lot of good talk about it. Shang-Chi, people still talked about it and encouraged other people to watch it when it was streaming, which gives it a new life on Disney+. Plus, and we're getting more Shang-Chi. With Eternals, not all the talk is really there. A lot of people aren't like, oh, my favorite Eternal is. A lot of people are just still, I don't even know who the Eternals are still, even after watching the movie. I think that's also a difference. We are still going to get more Eternals in the future, including a couple that have been deceased, I guess, at the end of Eternals. Icarus and Gilgamesh will be returning, and I don't know in what capacity, but we have already covered news items that they will be returning, as well as we know that the ones that were on the spaceship are returning. One, I don't know if the ones on Earth are going to be returning or not, but you are going to have Eternals that are returning. I just don't know in what capacity. I don't think they get a Disney Plus film. I, I think they're thrown into other properties as they go forward. And it just kind of sucks for Chloe's out because I know she tried her hardest, but it's just not hitting with audiences and it was at a bad time. So we'll see if the next one hits or not. And that might be what Marvel executives were talking about, about we have 30 whatever properties in development. Some we're going to hit and some we're going to miss. They might have known that Eternals wasn't going to score so well because of, you know, previewings and stuff like that. But I don't know. Anyway, Chris, what we got going on with Guardians of the Galaxy? So we had James Gunn talking to Deadline.com about the end of the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise and the Peacemaker's Butterfly Secret over on Hero Nation podcast. I don't mean to scare everybody. Because when I say end of the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise, here is the quote from James Gunn and Deadline. This is the end for us. The last time people will see this team of Guardians that James told uh, Hero Nation about franchise's conclusion with the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, which for now is scheduled to be coming out on May 5th, 2023. CBR also later had an article jumping a little bit further into that. I just want to be true to the characters, the story, and give people the wrap-up that they deserve for the story. It's always a little bit scary. I'm doing my best. It's big. It's so, so big and dark and different from what people might be expecting it to be, James Gunn said. He also referred to the pressure of ending the film franchise as a trilogy. I'm aware that the third film in most trilogies suck, he admitted with the caveat, not always. I am fine with this team not going forward for a variety of reasons, some I would not get into right now, but it makes sense 
or characters to move on from a group, forcing characters to stay together just to stay together can make for a boring story. I know there were some issues at the end of Endgame where Gamora was not recognizing Star-Lord, so I think there's definitely going to be some things going on with the sisters there, but we'll see exactly how it ends and which characters go forward and which don't, or maybe they all don't. I don't know. If the franchise loses Rocket and Root, I think that would be a huge problem for them. I'm not so sure Star-Lord has to stay around, though, or not. I don't know. Chris, what do you think? I think one thing that this Guardians of the Galaxy Switch has going for it is that over in the comics, it is kind of a rotating team. Not nearly as much as X-Men is, but you do have the precedent for people leaving, new people coming in, people coming back who have left. I mean, obviously, Groot and Rocket, especially Groot, are the stars here. I'm really sad that some characters might be leaving. I'm happier that some other characters might be leaving. I will seriously cry if certain other characters leave, even more so than just being sad about it. But this is something that already has a precedent set. And even if just one person leaves, then that's the team being different and completely fulfills to the requirement of James Gunn saying that this is the last uh, that we'll see of this team. I haven't read the latest run of Guardians of the Galaxy. I know my son does. I just haven't kept up with it as much. The last time I remember talking about the Guardians as a whole, I know Kitty Pride was involved in, I do believe that's historical or whatever that comic book accurate, if that's what you want to call it, that Kitty Pride and Star Learn had some sort of relationship. But in the particular run that I was reading, Kitty Pride was Star Lord. So I understand that even that moniker shifts from Peter Quill from time to time as well. Like, uh, what, is, what was that with the all new, all different? It was like Old Man Peter Quill or something like that. There was a comic book run on that. So he obviously wasn't Star Lord anymore. Anyway, we'll see what happens next year, hopefully, May 2023, what goes on with Guardians of the Galaxy 3. I'm looking forward to that one. I'm, Guardians of the Galaxy, that's one of my comfort films, and we'll talk about that in a bit. To end our news story, though, for the week, I want to talk a little bit about Loki Season 2. We are all looking forward to Loki Season 2 because we don't think Loki Season 1 ended very well, so we're looking forward to Season 2. So here's what's happening. Last week, there's been a couple of reports from murphysmultiverse.com about Season 2. Here's the quote from the article that I pulled up. Production on the second season of Marvel Studios' Loki series is reported to begin this summer at Pinewood Studios. And it appears one of the first season's biggest stars will be there when it happens. Guru Macbeth Raw, I'm pretty sure I mispronounced that, my apologies. The British actress who played the TVA judge and series antagonist, which was Ravona Renslayer, has confirmed that she will indeed be returning for the show's next batch of episodes. During an interview with Michael Strahan on Good Morning America, that's GMA for those in the know, she was asked about her involvement with the future of the Disney Plus exclusive. Her response, accompanied by a huge smile, was short and straightforward. Quote, I know there is a season two. I know that I'm in it. And that's about all I can say. After which, I'm sure the Marvel snipers were there to hit her with tasers or whatever they do on GMA these days. I'm glad she's going to be back. Her storyline was interesting, her development. I'm glad she's going to be back. She was a really interesting character. And really, I think most of the people in that show were really interesting characters. So anybody coming back, I think, is a good one. Especially the alligator. Alligator Loki. Oh, we can't lose Alligator Loki. So that's the most important thing is that Loki season two is in production, which should be out in 2023 time frame. I don't know, maybe later this year. We'll see how things go. All right, that's it for the news. And we have some feedback from you. All 
All right. All the agents of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. have access to the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. Twitter account, including Agent Lauren, who's not here. So I have no idea who posted this, but somebody on our Twitter account posted, what's your, quote, comfort, unquote, MCU movie? There was a various different responses. I'll just run them down really quick. Andy Migna said Thor Ragnarok. I like Thor Ragnarok. That was a pretty cool movie. At Mr. Paraclete said probably Captain America First Avenger. When it came out, it wasn't that big of a hit, but I can see how you like going back there, especially since it's got Tommy Lee Jones in it. I mean, who doesn't like Tommy Lee Jones, right? At Cody from Zero said Winter Soldier, Cap 1, and Thor 3 are up there too. So he's going Winter Soldier, and I might be mistaken, but I think Lauren might be on that with Winter Soldier. I'm not sure. We'll have to ask Lauren when she comes back next week. And at Alex Keeler said Guardians. I'm assuming the first Guardians of the Galaxy, but it could be the second one. I don't know. Maybe it's both. So, Chris, what are your comfort MCU movies? Either of the Guardians films because of Groot. Like, it doesn't matter what else, but also Hulk because Hulk just holds a special place in my heart. I know a lot of people are going to fight you on that, but okay. Okay. It got new legs i guess they're in what if as well there's a lot of backstory with hulk which we don't have time to get into here so michelle what is your comfort mcu movie or movies i like ragnarok makes me laugh it's not so much a feel-good movie as a I enjoy watching it I enjoyed watching it before Chadwick Boseman died and I'm always talking about Black Panther because of the artistry of it the characterization the power of the women it was an amazing movie where it's now some of you might can still consider it a comfort movie I still see it as a comfort movie, but then there's an extra layer of just sort of like, I need to wrap myself up in a blanket because Chadwick is no longer with us. This is a really good movie. It was in my consideration when I thought about what would be my comfort movie. I thought of that. I thought of Thor Ragnarok. I thought of Guardians of the Galaxy, the first one. Cause I, I, don't, I mean, even the second one, it starts with the little dancing and everything going on. So, I mean, I like it, but uh, I think the one movie that I keep coming back to more and more and more, and unfortunately it's starting to get a little bit dated, just a little bit, but not much, is Iron Man. So Iron Man would be my comfort movie. They're all good. It's it's fun every once in a while just to go watch them all. I had started a watch through, kind of stopped because I was doing some other watch throughs. I'm going to go back, do that, and eventually I'm going to do an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. watch through again. Hopefully by the end of this year, I'll have that all done. It's a lot. A lot of episodes with that, so when I start, it's going to be going on for a while. I have a question for all of you. Do any of you go to Endgame and basically just sort of watch the last, basically from, you know, Captain on your left, maybe a little bit before that, just the whole in the sequence part of it? Do any of you do that? I haven't done that yet. I have. Oh, I mean, I have, which is, I have, that's kind of a comfort, but it's not, it's like that spot and then forward. It's not exactly the whole movie. I think the rest of the movie is kind of set up to get to that point. There's a couple of sad moments in there and definitely Tony's death is a very sad moment that occurs. It's forward in the movie. So you don't get Black Widow's death. So you don't get upset about how that was handled, I guess. So I guess that's how I handle the movie. Although my comfort movie, I'm going to be clear. My comfort movie that I put on whenever I just want something on in the background is The Martian. I just want to make that clear. That is the one that I have on in the background all the time. Every once in a while, I'll be like, okay, I watched The Martian three days in a row. Time for something else. So I will put on like an MCU movie or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's it, The Martian is my comfort, the comfort movie. But if I'm going to do a... MCU comfort movie, probably more often than not, it's Iron Man. Yeah, the original Iron Man 2008. All right, so if you, listener, didn't get a chance to get us your opinion when we threw out that tweet, whoever threw out that tweet, I'll admit it was me. But 
whoever threw out the tweet, if you didn't get a chance to respond, let us know. I would love to know what your comfort movie is. I don't know, Chris, it's um, Friday Eve. We're recording this. What do you think we should do now? I think we're definitely just going to have to pour ourselves a drink and get ready for the coming apocalypse. It's something the X-Men would do. Definitely something the X-Men would do. I want to thank our listener for continuing to listen. I want to thank everybody that gives us feedback on Twitter and on Discord, which you can find at gunnygeek.com slash Discord. Would love to hear from you about how you like the X-Men. I would love to hear from anybody, by the way, about Margaret Lesh. Really would like some more information about her or maybe direct contact information with her or something like that. She was amazing. Just love to have her on the podcast for a few minutes. That would be cool. And I would also like to promote another podcast, not necessarily on the network. It's part of the better podcasting sphere of podcast producers that we have out there. Mercury Theater Podcast, which I had my original voice acting on. They just produced their and published their recent episode, I Think Therefore I Am. And it is an amazing episode. It's a mind frack episode. So I'm just going to warn you ahead of time. It's not feel good. It's a mind frack episode, but it's so well done. Go and get it. It's at Mercury Theater Podcast. I think, therefore, I am. And thank you for checking that out. Yes, again, thank you to everyone who listens and watches and interacts with us. You can find me on Twitter at shell underscore game. I am also on the Nerds with Dice Twitch, Tuesdays, 8 p.m. with our Rifts game. Yes, Ballad of Fates is coming to a close, but we will be starting up something again because it's us and it's Tuesday and that's what we do. Hearing everybody, how much they're enjoying the show, enjoying what we're doing here, really just puts a a new little bit of energy into us doing this. And so every little time that somebody comes and says they're enjoying what we're doing, it's great. And if you want to hear other things from me, you can head on over to playcomics.com where as we're recording this, the newest episode, I talked to letterer of comics, Taylor Esposito, not singing person, Taylor Esposito. I think I made the right choice there. And the next episode, I'm talking to Erica Schultz about a comic that she has coming out. I listened to your episode with Taylor on it. It was enlightening. Matter of fact, you guys were talking about maybe classes to do it. And I was thinking, oh, you got to go to some art school for like three, four years or something like that. Uh, you're talking about a class for like 150 bucks. I'm considering doing it. Yeah, that's awesome just to know how to do it. And I thought all the letters drew by hand, but he was saying that it was done by computer, like normal font or something like that. I don't, I don't remember exactly, but if you want more information about that, go check out the latest episode of play comics, all right? If you want to get with us or if you want to give us feedback, including that I'm wrong because Lord knows I'm wrong enough. Remember our contact information, our website, legends of our voicemail one eight, four, four, the bus one, one eight four four eight four three two eight seven one. Our Twitter account is at Legends of Shield, all one word. Our YouTube, which you're probably watching this on YouTube at youtube.com slash gunna geek. And our Discord server, I'll double tap that again at gunna geek.com slash Discord. All right, gang, it's been fun this week. Got a lot of research into Margaret. We'll see who I research next week. Y'all are welcome to research somebody too. Until next time, I'm Director SP. I'm Agent Michelle. And I'm Agent Chris. See everybody next time. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening. If you want to leave us feedback, go to gunageek.com and you will find all our contact information and other shows. You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod, found at incompetech.com and also artists on pond5.com and audiojungle.net. 
The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual hosts and do not represent Stargate Pioneer Productions, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation, Marvel Studios, and ABC. No infringement is intended. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is copyright 2013 through 2022.